Hi, I'm Rob Wheatley, Head of Client Services for Commercial Real Estate at the Optimize Group. Today I have with me Kian O'Donnell, Head of Client Services for Renewables, also at the Optimize Group. And today we're looking at buying green energy. So how are you doing, Kian? Doing great, Rob. Can't complain. Great. Well, thanks for your time and uh, giving us uh, your input today. And um, perhaps you could quickly introduce yourself to uh, people watching. Yeah, sound. Um, so I predominantly work with renewable generators. Um, however, given the crossover, I also work with clients in the wider business, such as commercial real estate, um, to help them with their net zero journey. Great. Okay. So buying green, first things first, what does that mean? Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose, as we know, in the commercial real estate sector, it isn't always feasible to generate renewable energy to cover the entire energy consumption for, on site. Um, limited roof space, you know, it's just not possible. Um, so aside from generating your own renewable energy and reducing your consumption, the next best thing to do is to make sure the energy you purchase through the grid is from a low carbon or renewable resource. Yeah, absolutely. A bit of an entry level question, really, but uh, worth asking. So I guess as we move down this, um, a bit of detail around what people should be looking for when they're buying green energy contracts. Yeah, so um, I would kind of summarise this as being the 50 shades of green um, on the electricity contract side. Not all green energy is the same and not all green energy contracts are the same. Um, the devil is definitely in the detail. Uh, to explain, you know, there's two elements. There's so the first one is where the suppliers are buying their energy from, the fuel mix, and where they're sourcing the certificates from, the renewable energy certificates. These don't always have to be from the same place, so this can understandably lead to some confusion. Um, and, you know, it, unfortunately, it's not exactly like buying a car brand where you've got the logo on the front of it. Um, and, you know, if we take an example of a business buying, like buying their energy through a green energy contract, um, the first question I would ask is, can they confirm the source of energy that they're purchasing? They might say, you know, it's wind, solar, biomass, or they mightn't even know. Um, and then I, would, I could also ask them, you know, is it only the certificates that they're getting through this contract? Or if it's both the power and the certificates? And this might prove a little bit more difficult for them to answer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and existing renewable sources such as hydro, which have been in the mix for years and potentially are now being sold as, you know, a new green renewable, um, you know, energy contract, which isn't strictly true. Um, so, what proportion of the UK electricity mixes renewables today? Yeah, so, okay, um, if you look back at 2019, like it has increased a lot over the years, but back in 2019, um, it, it actually met up 37% of the entire supply. And, and this is great, you know, but we've got a long way to go if we want to further decarbonise the grid to reach our net zero targets. Yeah, okay. And, and Europe, is, is there a different story over there? What about renewables? coming from, from Europe over here. Yeah, yeah, there's quite a lot. And actually, um, in fact, some of the certificates come in, you know, as we already mentioned, 37%, which is equates to 120 terawatt hours um, of renewable energy is generated in the UK in 2019. In the same year, actually, 60 terawatt hours, so half of what we generate ourselves, was actually certificates coming in from Europe. Um, there had been some questions over these guarantees of origin and how they would be Delta would have to Brexit, so there's a lot still there to, to I suppose, come out of the come out of the wash. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that additionality is probably the key uh, aspect here. Then, so can you tell us about buying a green energy contract to help support additionality in the growth of renewables? Okay. So additionality has become a very popular term recently. That it effectively means you know supporting the development of new renewable projects that might have otherwise not got not have got built. Um, and while it's good to supply, you know, to buy your energy from a supplier that sources their energy from renewable generators, um, that doesn't necessarily lead to supporting new developments. Um, and I'm not saying you know something bad about Regos, they're not a bad thing. Uh, but I would add here that you know no no plant has ever been built, no renewable energy plant has ever been built on the promise of somebody buying their Rego certificates. Um, it's, it's actually a tiny value that some, not even all, of renewable generators get paid on. Um, so I would say if, you're, if you want to support the development of new renewable projects, then a corporate PPA would probably be the best route to go. 
Okay, so there's a couple of bits there, and corporate PPAs, um, green certificates. So maybe you could explain what are the different ways you can buy green energy today? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd like to think this is kind of like being a ladder. Um, at the bottom of the ladder, it's the do nothing approach, same as, you know, same as always. Um, once the next step, you know, the first step up, let's say, that'd be buying your energy from a green energy supply contract. Um, the one up again from that might be buying from a, a, a supplier that only purchases 100% of their energy from renewables so that for their fuel mix. Um, the next step up that ladder could be corporate PPAs, and that's entering a price agreement directly with a renewable energy project. Um, so you'll have full traceability and you'll be able to you know, you'll also help a new project achieve funding on the back of this long-term price commitment. And then lastly, um, so the top of the ladder would kind of be this, you know, would be the new model of consuming 100% of renewable energy, 100% of the time it's needed, you know, which is known as the 100 by 100 model, which is kind of like the pinnacle of where energy, a renewable energy contracts are at the, at the minute. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of these 100 by 100 models and um, I'm seeing them really associated with, you know, as you say, it's the pinnacle of energy contracts, probably the pinnacle of uh, organisations out there, the Googles of this world. Um, so given that that might be out of reach for a lot of uh, commercial real estate customers, um, corporate PPAs are probably the main target. Could you expand a little more on that just to uh, fill in some more detail? Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Um, so corporate PPAs, they basically join the dots between the generator and end user. Um, so the buyer, the buyer to the seller, effectively, um, and using the grid and supplier as kind of like the delivery mechanism in the middle. Um, in a post post uh, renewable subsidy market, so you may have known about rocks or fits, you love them come up, come up, but in kind of the post subsidy era, um, corporate PPAs are great to be able to support the kind of the long term price for the power that they will generate. Uh, the major bridge in this, I guess, you know, this is kind of like more of a mindset, is that where companies have traditionally been buying their energy on a one, two, or three year basis. Uh, for many many years trying to get across the look at kind of like a corporate ppa which would need you know it might be a 10 to 15 year purchase it's just getting around that kind of new, new mindset and new approach yeah yeah makes sense and obviously the benefits of a ppa is you know you are driving forward the additionality as you say the addition of more renewables into the system which is decarbonizing us as a as a whole very attractive then but i'm sure there's some challenges what sort of consumption volumes do you need to enter into a corporate ppa okay so if i was looking to enter into a direct or like a bespoke agreement i'll kind of say around the region of 15 you need about 15 to 20 gig minimum would be suitable um there's no upper limit by the way you know the larger consumption volumes the better really when you're looking at these projects um but there are of course and I, I, might, I might have mentioned you know 15 to 20 gig but don't worry you know there are of course options for smaller supplies um however this would be more looking towards kind of like a amalgamated basket or consortium approach um this a, a group approach like this can be a little bit trickier to get everyone get, to get everyone on side uh, but also you know this does help on setup costs and credit approval yeah makes sense and um i happen to know you're working on baskets with some of our customers so uh great plug for anyone listening um, <laughs> uh, we mentioned then volume being maybe one of the challenges what about the big challenge to uh let's say large portfolio holders where they're constantly thinking about moving in different parts of the sector and and there's uh reduction in volumes and increases over time um so they won't know where they, they're going to be in consumption five years or so down the line. What what can they do? Can you give any guidance? Okay, yeah. So I like to think of the volumes. I like to think about it as kind of a bit of imagery, really, you know, kind of a glass and a tap. Um, where the glass is the consumption requirement and the tap is the supply. And there's an intricate balance to be made. You know, how much of it does need, needs to be filled? Um, especially five years, if you're not too sure of where you're going to be at the moment. And I'm going to... Use a bit of, using a bit of imagery and my uh, my my old love for Blue Peter or Art Attack. I'm going to something that you might maybe familiar with, Rob. This is a well, a 
a Guinness glass season, for this example, and you may and you may and and you may be aware that Guinness is a two-part pour as well if it's if it's done right. Uh, notice the Weatherspoons. Um, so it's really seeing what volume they might need in future years. And again, you know, they might be looking over the term, if they're not too sure, 10%, 20%, they might say 50%, um, or it could be even, you know, they might think 60 or 70, they're not going to drop below there. So really, if they're looking at the volumes, they don't need to buy it all up front. So they might say, okay, we're happy getting maybe 50% of our volume uh, purchased in a long-term contract. Well, do my best of drawing in here quickly. So this is the long-term purchase. This would be the corporate PPA. Um, and then when it comes to delivery, you're kind of looking more in the short-term market. So if they weren't too sure about their overall, then all of this would be purchased in the short-term markets through their risk, through their trading and, and hedging strategy. So it's basically long-term be the corporate PPA. And if they're not too sure about what they're going to consume, obviously keep this, this could be dropped lower and all of the short-term will be bought when needed. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So there's a balance then between risk and reward, the positive impact that the uh, organisation's making and still being able to make that contribution towards the decarbonisation. Excellent, okay. So um, does entering a corporate PPA cost more? That's cost is always a big question. Yeah, okay, this again, probably a question that crops up a lot, but if I was gonna sit on the fence, I'd probably say not really. And what I mean by that is that new wind and solar projects are actually now the cheapest form of energy. Um, the, par the power market as well is only priced three years ahead. So these prices that are only priced three years ahead are also used on the basis to create these on a corporate PPA, a 10 year price, for example. Um, given how volatile the market is, as just as we've seen at the start of your 2021, um, trying to accurately predict where the prices are going to be in five to ten years is ne next to impossible. Um, so it's quite hard to say whether the prices are going to be higher or lower than the corporate PPA price that you will set into the, given today's market. Um, however, if you look at it on, on another way, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of people using corporate PPAs to increase their price certainty, their long-term price certainty, where they're not able to buy energy out you know 10 15 years ahead ahead in any other way great fair enough we won't argue with you um so i think that probably covers this on uh, power the the next area i think which is uh, gaining quite a bit of interest is green gas um what is it can you tell us a bit more about that okay um absolutely i suppose we've we've, we've uh, dominated and a lot of the headlines get dominated by power but however um, there are currently around 100 biomethane plants producing and injecting green gas into the UK gas network. Uh, we work with several, several of these. And just like we mentioned earlier about power, these work with very similar principles in, in, with the two parts, where there's the green gas commodity and the uh, certificates. And just like on the power side, these can be traded independently. The main difference though is, is unlike on the power side, where renewables that we mentioned are making up roughly 40% of the, of the power supply, green gas is less than 1% of the total UK gas usage. Um, so still quite a niche market with premiums to be considered. Um, so most, most consumers really, they're buying green gas, they tend to just purchase the green gas certificate. However, to increase this transparency of supply, we tend to bundle bundle both of these elements together um, in some of the deals that we've done to date. So it's clear that both the gas and certificates are being bought from the same source. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, that's really helpful information. Um, so I think if I just summarise what I'm hearing, that um, really if you want to enter into a green energy contract, You've really got to be aware of the details, know what you're getting, understand it's about transparency, seeing if those are certificates, if they're legitimate. Um, that, that I think is a very important uh, aspect now. Um, if you want to support the build of a new renewable project, then a corporate PPA is the best route, creating that additionality. 
and if you use gas and you want to decarbonize then there are options now around green gas and presumably people can contact you via the website which or our group website so the uh, optimizegroup.com and um, contact us via that but um, great I mean thank you for your time today very uh, generous to share your insight and uh, I'm sure you'll uh, get lots of interest from uh, some of those topics you've touched on today. Yeah, absolutely. I think Tiki summarised it great there, actually. Okay, thanks again. Take care. Bye. Cheers, Rob.